Good day, everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and welcome to our webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we live and work here at the Australia Institute on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to Elders past and present. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded, and uh, I hope we can all recommit ourselves to the voice to Parliament uh, coming down the line as a referendum. Just a few Zoom tips before we begin to help make sure this runs smoothly. We've got a Q&A box where you can type in questions for Sarah and Richard uh, for the second half of the webinar. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder, this discussion is being recorded and it'll go up on our YouTube channel later today. You can find that at australiainstitute.tv. So the recent State of the Environment report really laid bare the devastating impacts that we are having on our natural environment with species extinction due to habitat loss, logging and development, and of course, the impacts of accelerating and dangerous climate change. Australia is the world's third largest exporter of fossil fuels, which causes climate change. Yet our environment laws are weak, very currently, and uh, we're very excited to have Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, the Greens spokesperson for Environment and Water, here today with us to discuss the climate trigger bill that the Greens have introduced into the federal parliament, uh, which would allow the government uh, to assess climate impacts when looking at future fossil fuel uh, projects. Senator Hanson Young, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here, Ev and Richie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and joined uh, uh, by Richie Mersey, and Director of our Climate and Energy Program here at the Australia Institute. Um, Sarah, thank you again for joining us here today. Mm -hmm. I wanted to start by asking you about the climate trigger bill that you've introduced to Parliament. Mm -hmm. If you could explain to us the reason why it's so important and and what impact it will have. What will it actually do? Well. As you said, Australia's uh, environment is under massive threat right now. We have, um, we are a world leader, in fact, of extinction, and uh, which is just a terrible record to have. Um, I prefer that we were a world leader of protecting our environment, but right now um, we are really lagging behind. Even our iconic species like the koala is facing extinction. And that is just mind boggling. You know, when you travel around the world and you tell people that Australia's koala is on the brink of extinction, people are shocked. How on earth has this happened? And it is being supercharged by uh, habitat loss and uh, the threats of, of the climate crisis. And you can see that in, um, plain sight when you look at those, the footage of the summer bushfires. And the, those images that went around the world of koalas uh, burnt because of the bushfires was a very powerful message of what we are facing. Um, our environment is being, uh, is on the brink of collapse uh, and yet ignoring the climate crisis is making this a whole lot worse. So our bill, a climate trigger bill, um, what it does is it allows for and our environment laws to take into consideration the climate impacts, the pollution uh, of any new projects. Now, it's kind of crazy, right, that if you have a coal or gas project or a big uh, development that needs to go through an environmental assessment, right now, the environment minister can look at the criteria and say, well, uh, nothing to see here, fine, uh, give it the, the, the green tick. Um, without considering at all uh, the, the climate pollution impact, the, the impact that climate change is going to have on that environment and elsewhere. So our bill puts a, um, a, a new clause which forces the Minister of the Day to consider the climate impacts of any project uh, before giving an assessment. And it's split at two levels. Um, at the highest level for those projects that are emitting over 100,000 tonnes, it says, no, we can't have this. And we can't. If we're going to deal with dangerous climate change, we can't keep making climate change worse. So they would be ruled out. But for those that fall under, every project has to be assessed on the basis of their pollution, the impact of their pollution, and it has to be taken into the assessment overall. And um, this is because, as we know, um, we can't just uh, kind of uh, just cut pollution 
going forward, we have to be cutting pollution that already exists. So the last thing we need to do is um, have our environment minister signing off on projects that are going to make things even even harder to deal with. Yeah. And Richie, coming to you on that, uh, you know, I think most people would actually be shocked to realise that there is no mechanism currently to assess climate impacts in that way for projects. Um, how important will this be to make sure there is something that the minister can use? Because how big of a problem is this? It's mm -hmm. a huge problem, right? So Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels. We established that a few years ago, but it's growing the problem. It's not, you know, putting a clamp down on it. We have 114 new fossil fuel projects in the works. There's over 70 new coal mines, set, you know, 40 new gas projects. And so if we don't have a mechanism to actually vet that, to filter that through and say, does this marry up with our climate objectives? then we're just gonna to continue to roll out the red carpet. And the whole purpose of the 43% bill that the government just passed was to try and integrate the Paris Agreement across whole of government operations. And the consequential amendments did that for some agencies that fund fossil fuel projects, but it didn't do it in terms of factoring that consideration in for big new projects. And currently the government doesn't have a method or a process or any real mechanism to consider new fossil fuel projects and how that actually marries up with our target. Well, it's, it's almost the opposite. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I saw a comment from uh, Madeline King, the resources minister the other day, in relation to uh, opening up the Beedaloo Basin as a, as a new gas field. And she said, well, as long as uh, it, uh, these projects pass rigorous environmental assessment, then they're okay. It's totally fine. Um, yeah. But the question is, what is rigorous environmental assessment? And as it currently sits on the books, uh, the minister does not even have to consider the climate damage of them. So it's a bit of a furphy uh, to suggest that uh, getting environmental approval for a new coal or gas mine or big development um, uh, is actually about looking after the environment. Yeah. Um, you've just raised the Beedaloo Basin. I was going to talk about this later, but now you've mentioned it. Um, I noticed you were talking yesterday about some of the specific subsidies around the Beedaloo Basin. Obviously, we're not far away from the federal budget. Mm. Uh, we do have a large deficit that the Treasurer keeps talking about a lot as a reason why we can't do certain things or can't afford certain things. Um, you commissioned the, or the Greens commissioned the Parliamentary Budget Office to look at some of those subsidies. What did you find? Uh, well, what we found was that there's at least, uh, there's $2 billion there that currently, uh, of money that was um, promised by Scott Morrison when he was Prime Minister uh, off the back, most of it was off the back of the pandemic. Remember when the gas-led recovery was going to save oh, us? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so at $2 billion um, in the budget, which um, had been promised to fund fossil fuel uh, subsidies in a variety of different ways, it's sitting there, but it hasn't actually been committed. So no contracts have been signed. So we're calling on Labor to say, well, look, if you're going through the budget with a fine-tooth comb, which is what they've argued, uh, to find waste uh, and, you know, try and trim the budget down on things that don't need to be there. Uh, all we're saying, here's $2 billion. It's been found by the Parliamentary Budget Office. It hasn't been committed. It was going to be given in fossil fuel subsidies. Um, let's redirect that uh, to renewable projects and helping to drive people's energy prices down through uh, electrifying their appliances, their cars, uh, helping people actually be part of the transition. Um, and some of this money, of course, when we talk about fossil fuel subsidies, there's plenty more fossil fuel subsidies baked into the budget. This is simply money that hasn't had a contract written against it. So there's no sovereign risk of, of removing it. Um, but when you look at all of this, you think, hang on a minute, taxpayers' money being spent propping up an industry that we know we have to transition away from. It's just throwing good money after bad. And uh, we're talking about waste. Well, let's junk it. Yeah. Um, Richie, the Australian Institute's obviously done a lot of work around fossil fuel subsidies. Um, if you could just kind of remind us of the scale of subsidies that we're talking about, apart from this uncommitted kind of two billion so yeah. far, but also the Beedaloo Basin, what are the climate impacts of proceeding with more development in the Beedaloo? Sure. Um, beginning with the gas-fired recovery, right? 
from the start, the Australian Institute was saying this is the worst sector to invest in for economic growth because it's so capital intensive. And what we found actually is that the gas industry were busy firing their employees during the gas fired recovery. So maybe they, they took it the wrong way, but 10% of their workforce were let go during that one year that we looked at in 2020, 2021. So we didn't see the real kind of investment or growth there, but we did see a lot of money committed. And it's great to see that being reallocated more broadly on fossil fuel subsidies. The Australian Institute's most recent research found $10.5 billion worth of federal fossil fuel subsidies. So supporting the use of fossil fuels um, or the production of fossil fuels. So that money could also be shaved down and reallocated. I mean, just one budget line item federal government spends in terms of um, the fuel rebate, that's bigger than what the Australian government spends on the Australian army per year. So yeah. there's a, it's a huge amount of money that we use to dedicate towards an industry that we should actually be sunsetting rather than propping up. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at some of these massive gas basins, they're huge. They'll massively blow out Australia's carbon budget, if you want to put it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just the emissions that Australia will face if it opens these gas basins up, but also all the emissions that it'll be sending overseas as well. well we've just had a bill pass through the parliament, and I, I think historic in, in the sense of uh, finally a legislative commitment to cutting pollution, 43%. And I know that that is nowhere near uh, uh, enough in terms of where we've got to go. Um, it, we have to be getting to, to, to net zero and we've got to be doing it much faster than 2050, let's be honest, if we're going to keep uh, temperatures at 1.5 degrees. Um, but even if you look at that 43%, as a as a starter, as a, as a bottom, how on earth are we going to meet that if we keep opening up new uh, gas fields that are going to make pollution even worse? Don't we have so much work to do to cut the pollution that already exists? Mm. Yeah, I'm just I, I find it, it 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 doesn't make it just doesn't make logical sense at all. Yeah, and I think part of it is because you have actors in society, namely the fossil fuel industry, that will find any excuse to justify opening up more projects. So the International Energy Agency were quite clear in saying 1.5 degrees means no new investment in coal and gas and oil. And they said that last year. Yeah. But there is a small amount of growth in our corner of the world, in the Asia Pacific. And so you're seeing companies like Woodstone say, oh, that, that growth there, that's us. Everyone else will have to stop it. You know, that's us there. And that's the problem. Really, there is no space for new fossil fuel projects. Uh, and that's real, that, that's what we should be seeing legislated into well, Australian law. That was interesting um, in relation to the Beetaloo uh, as well this week with Origin Energy uh, pulling out of uh, their Beetaloo uh, kind of, um, uh, projects and saying that they, they refer to it themselves as divesting, which I thought was interesting, <laughs> divesting from themselves yeah. um, uh, because they wanted to be part of the transition of going forward. Now, uh, it says to me, if a big company like Origin Energy uh, is looking at the Beetaloo and saying it's not worth it, why on earth would we be spending public money uh, subsidising these projects? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, that it kind of does bring me now to the safeguards mechanism. So that's currently uh, supposed to be regulating high polluting facilities and industry, including gas and coal mines. Uh, the Labor government's looking at reforming that mechanism, but currently there's nothing in there to really stop new gas and coal mines um, under the safeguard mechanism. Do you really see the climate trigger bill and that legislation as kind of doing the work that the, the safeguards mechanism isn't to manage those new gas and coal projects? Yes. I mean, the climate trigger bill is essential for strengthening our environment laws, but really sending a very clear message that our environment itself cannot handle any more of this. Uh, it is our environment that is on the brink of collapse. And we are facing two dual crises at the same time, uh, an environmental crisis uh, and the climate crisis, and they are fueling each other. It's a double, it's a double whammy. Um, <clears throat> the loss of forest, the loss of habitat, obviously uh, makes climate change worse. Uh, you, we need to be investing in restoring the environment, actually, uh, as much as protecting what is left. Um, so the climate trigger bill um, is essential in that. But you're right, the safeguard mechanism um, doesn't deal with uh, new coal and gas or new fossil fuels at this point. Um, and I am very concerned about where this, where this is going. Look, the Greens are you know, prepared to negotiate and talk with the government about it. Um, but 
uh, if it's simply going to be kind of keeping things at status quo, that is not enough. Um, and if you're going to, if it's going to allow new coal and gas projects to kind of fit under that um, uh, uh, kind of um, cap, then uh, what does that mean for every for all the smaller players? And how do we actually make sure the environment itself is looked after? Yeah, and presumably, Richie, what does it mean for like? other sectors of the economy yeah. as well if we keep yeah. allowing new gas and coal in is the farming the agricultural sector going to have to do more to reduce its emissions that type of thing but i wonder just for people at home who aren't familiar with the safeguards mechanism which is probably most people yeah, yeah. let's be honest um yeah. because yeah the last government didn't really use it <laughs> effectively um what is it what yeah. does it do yeah so or supposed uh, to do yeah. so 10 years ago uh, we had a carbon price and it worked. It was an economy-wide carbon price, covered most of our emitting sectors and emissions went down over the two years that it operated and the economy grew. And I just have to interrupt you. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, this was the carbon price that was negotiated uh, between the Greens and, and, and the Gillard government and it worked. It worked. It was a good negotiation and it worked. It worked. Emissions went down over the period that it operated, the two-year period, and the economy grew. The sky didn't fall in. In fact, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Um, and the price that the, the, the price was about $23, $24 a ton of, of carbon pollution. And then we scrapped it and then emissions went up for the next number of years. And the um, coalition government built uh, what they called the safeguards mechanism. So they took the most high polluting facilities, about 215 high polluting facilities, coal and gas mines, aluminium smelters, steel works, and that kind of stuff. And they said, all right, we're going to try and cap your emissions. But they gave so much headroom to these companies that they actually polluted more. And so we went from you know, 130 million tonnes per year in 2016 to 140 last year. The difference is about the same as every single domestic flight over the course of a year. So right. that, that's what we didn't safeguard. It. The only thing we were safeguarding were polluters yep. from actually having to reduce their pollution over the last eight years. Now, the Labor government wants to take this and tighten those caps, which is good but it won't do anything about new coal and gas projects coming in. Now, half of those 215 facilities, half of the emissions are from coal and gas projects mm -hmm. existing now, but there's huge new ones that will come online between now and 2030. Uh, and the Australian Institute's submission to the safeguards mechanism goes through just five or six of them to show that there'll be around 100,000, uh, um, no, sorry, more like 10 million tonnes of, of emissions that, that will come through if we basically allow these new coal and gas projects to just walk in. And that's why the climate trigger might be a nice complement because the safeguards reform is not actually safeguarding anything. Yeah, Sarah, I want to come back to you on the politics of it. So mm -hmm. clearly the federal election sent a really strong message. People elected a climate supermajority to the parliament. We've got independence. The Greens had... Uh, huge success at the election as well. Um, what's the politics of the safeguard mechanism versus kind of the climate trigger? Are you going to be insisting on the climate trigger um, legislation being voted on while the safeguards kind of mechanism is under review? Well, the real politics of, of it uh, is that you know, the Greens and uh independence you're right you know we, we we did really well at this election and the and it, it was a it was a climate election and they've delivered a a, a climate crossbench uh, we've got uh, obviously a strong um, block of support but we have a responsibility now to use this parliament to act on climate change at a time when we are re really running up against the clock I mean um, I've, I've sat in various Senate hearings and heard from the experts directly across the table about just how dire the situation is. And um, you, know, we, we, you can't hear that evidence and then sit back and go, oh, well, uh, it's all too hard. We'll wait till somebody else comes along. Uh, we actually have to be acting now. So um, we've got this new parliament. We've got all of these uh, voices, people that uh, have been elected to deliver on the climate and, and the Greens are, you know, it is our priority. Um, the 43% reduction bill um, uh, was strengthened and we worked hard with the government to, to get that through. And some people say, oh, it's just symbolic. Um, symbolism does matter. It's not everything. You need action, mm. but symbolism does matter. But what we now need is how we deliver this and how we actually deliver uh, cutting pollution. 
the government, the Labor government said at the time of negotiating on the 43% that, that the safeguard mechanism bill would be the bill that we could negotiate and talk and deal with uh, uh, new coal and gas. So, okay, well, here it is then. Um, we're worried that it could simply be, if it's not done properly, um, uh, a process to allow new coal and gas, uh, to allow more pollution, if it doesn't fix those um, loopholes that were there under the Tony Abbott scheme. Um, and uh, if it doesn't send a strong enough message uh, to industry that we have to be transitioning out. The climate trigger bill has now been introduced. It's sitting there on the table and we're saying very clearly to Labor, um, we need uh, to fix our environment laws. We need a climate trigger. Um, you know, we're happy to negotiate and, and work with you to fix the mechanism, um, but it's got to be more than that. Yeah. Uh, the, the time frame in all of this uh, is um, uh, you know, um, uh, becoming tighter. We're going to have uh, the safeguard mechanism will be in uh, regulations uh, and some supporting legislation. The difference with regulations is you can't amend them. You just have to vote against them, put in a disallowance and vote against them. The bills, of course, uh, can be amended. So there's going to be a lot of moving parts over the next few months. And our climate trigger bill is, is front and centre of one of the ways forward. To, to solve this problem. Mm. And Richie, just speaking of the, the kind of climate election that we've just had, clearly with the floods that we've experienced, um, the Black Summer bushfires more recently, uh, people really are feeling the impacts of climate change already in a lot of communities, um, most recently, you know, up and down the East Coast. But how much of this um, momentum, I guess, that we're seeing not only in the parliament, but I think in the public as well, is due to people really just, you know, like their houses are under threat or they can't get to work in Manly because the roads are underwater. Like it really is an acute situation. Yeah, no, it's climate impacts are here now, right? The climate's changed. Uh, it's no longer a future problem. And, and so you have to ask yourself, is Australia, is the government, uh, are we as a community doing everything we can to address this? And you know, there's always that issue of, well, Australia is doing its fair share. It's not, right? We've only just increased our domestic target, but we export more than twice that in terms of our fossil fuels, and we have no intention of subsiding. And so this is an opportunity to actually double down on that because those impacts are escalating. They're going to continue to escalate. The IPCC six assessment early this year on adaptation and impacts shows that, that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees of global warming under any scenario, even if globally we double down. So it's how do we actually do everything we can to bring that back down again? Mm. Um, and that's a real it's a real challenge globally, uh, and it's a real challenge here in Australia. And for the first time, we're having this sort of serious conversation. It is. Uh, I, I was overseas a few weeks ago, and the, the difference between being uh, talking about where Australia is on the issue of uh, climate, on biodiversity, uh, on the environment, uh, versus um, <laughs> Richie and I were both in uh, at Glasgow at the last uh, climate uh, conference, and being an Australian at that conference was pretty embarrassing, wasn't it? It yeah. just you know yeah. uh, people. Australia was the pariah on, on the world stage. And um, now the rest of the world is looking at us and saying, okay, well, how do we, you know, wh where is Australia going to step up now? And it's got to be more than just saying the words climate change um, and, you know, emissions reduction. Uh, so the, the world is now looking and going for, well, what do you actually, what, what is the actual action uh, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the hard uh, decisions and changes you're going to implement. I think um, th these next uh, this next 12 months is going to be a really kind of pivotal moment for does Australia actually get on board? Do we get serious about uh, stopping an expansion of new fossil fuels? And if the International Energy Agency says it can't be afforded, then you know what are, what what else do we need? Um, and then there's the kind of pivot to, well, what role does biodiversity have in this? And Australia um, has not been part of that conversation. At the end of the year, there will be the climate conference in uh, Egypt, but there's also a biodiversity COP, uh, which is similar, but for biodiversity, mm. that's going to be in Montreal in Canada in December. 
and there is going to be a huge amount of pressure on Australia to step up. Um, okay, you're talking about climate change, but what are you doing to protect biodiversity? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that brings me to COP and uh <laughs> We recently, or last week, uh, people might have tuned in to hear our conversation with the former president of Kiribati, Anote Tong, and the former president of Palau, Tommy Romengasau Jr. They were um, addressing a, a regional climate diplomacy forum that we have every year. But we asked them specifically, Sarah, about uh, this idea that the Labor government has put forward of hosting a COP, perhaps in um, partnership with a Pacific country they specifically were calling on a ban on new gas and coal projects but as we know that's kind of falling on on deaf ears but if we're gonna try and do this and host a cop should the pacific should our pacific neighbors really be insisting on some kind of a moratorium on new gas and coal projects as part of agreeing to that well it's a bit of a um backhanded compliment isn't it to say (laughs) uh well we want you to be part of this, Australia and, you know, the Labor government going, okay, let's, let, we want to be, we want to host the COP and we want the Pacific to jump on board. Uh, but meanwhile, we're going to keep opening up new coal and gas that makes climate change worse. And, uh, you know, sea level rise around the Pacific is going to uh, continue to escalate. Um, I think uh, the Pacific have a pivotal and powerful voice in this conversation. And I think it was wonderful to see the Pacific leaders Um, here over the last uh, couple of weeks Um, and this is this is essential this is uh, their life it is uh, their livelihoods it is their entire existence Uh, and uh, as it is for many Australians as you know you you just mentioned the the threats of climate change that we're already feeling here I mean we've got to get serious about this this is not in the never never this is now and uh, I think the Pacific leaders have a really important role to play in helping shape this. I mean, I, I think it would be, I think it'd be wonderful for Australia to host uh, the COP, uh, but we are going to have to bring more to the table than, um, uh, than we have so far. We need much stronger cuts. Uh, we need uh, to transition away from uh, coal and gas and, uh, and we, we've got to elevate the voices of those in our region, and that means the Pacific. Mm. Anything to add to that, Richie? Just that Minister um, Bowen, who's in charge of climate, is in New York right now, where they host an annual climate week, basically talking to a number of Pacific Island countries and other countries that will be essential for our bid, trying to lobby for that. And the message is that Australia wants to become a renewable energy superpower. But you can't have it both ways. We can't only, you know, it's great. We should be building the solutions for the future, but we also have to stop building the problem. And we're an expert in that. We haven't really nailed the first one, right? And so it is a trade-off and you have to realize it's a trade-off. And the message from uh, President Tong and President Romengasau will be just as clear in New York as it will be here, that there's no more room for new fossil fuel projects. And to give you one example, just the big Scarborough gas project in WA, that's more emissions just in the next couple of years it will will release when it comes online than all of Kiribati's and all of Palau's and and, and a good chunk of those small coral atolls. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you're there, the president, President Tong was saying within a couple of decades, the IPCC is saying they got to make some hard choices as a country that bought land in Fiji to potentially relocate. They don't want to have to do that. And then you're talking to Australia saying, let's partner. We're also going to open up a gas project that's bigger than all your emissions put together yeah. to mm. add to our burden. Mm. That's the problem. I um, And it's not just, of course, the Pacific leaders uh, who are, you know, putting the pressure on Australia. I was um, reading the speech from the president of the EU, the State of the Union address uh, last week, and it was so clear uh, in that, and they've got a lot of (laughs) issues to be dealing with right now in the EU, um, right on their doorstep in relation to, you know, the war with between um, uh, Ukraine and Russia. And here the president is saying we need to make nature our first ally because if we don't, uh, you know, all bets are off. So it's coming from all over and Australia mm. has to get out of this mindset that we can just keep digging stuff up, shipping it overseas and we don't have to worry about the pollution. Mm. Um, 
Uh, we're going to come to questions from the audience in just a second. I can see there's a, a bunch in there. We had more than a thousand people registered for today's webinar. So thanks for coming along. Um, before we get into questions, Sarah, I did just want to talk about uh, the renewable energy kind of superpower element that we're also mm -hmm. trying to pursue. As Richie said, it's kind of doesn't amount to much while we keep expanding the fossil mm -hmm. fuel industry. But <clears throat> We have seen this year, um, you know, electricity prices going up due to external factors, the fact that we're exporting a lot of our domestic gas, which is something the Australia Institute has talked a lot about. But uh, how much has the economics of things changed and in terms of actually rolling out those um, solutions that are available here now and are mm. effectively cheaper as well. Well, of course, I come from the great state of South Australia um, <laughs> where, you know, we are leading the country when it comes to uh, the transition mm. to renewables. And, um, you know, it, it, it can be done. It is being done. I think the, the issue that those in the renewable energy industry always tell us as politicians is, can you just put the settings in place so we can get on with the job? Stop putting mm. in roadblocks. And for the last uh, decade, um, uh, under the, you know, the coalition government, they just felt like they were being um, hampered uh, rather than even just kind of let mm -hmm. uh, let to go. And I know, you know, we had that uh, the energy minister at the time, uh, Angus Taylor, saying he was agnostic. Um, well, he wasn't really. Um, he was continuing to do the bidding of his fossil fuel mates at the same time uh, as uh, making it harder and harder for the renewable transition. So um, it is happening. It's uh, the industry simply needs politicians and government to agree on the terms and to let them, you know, uh, to get on with it. The, and Australia is um, so well placed, so well placed uh, to be uh, investing in the uh, superpower of renewables and you know with and we can be exporting that overseas you can be you know if you put in place proper storage proper demand uh, uh technology uh, demand response technology and put in place all those things actually we can do it um and we have an amazing ability to to access renewable resources here so we should but the longer we take uh, the further behind we're going to get and we're going to miss that advantage of being kind of first mover. Um, we're already late and we've got a lot of catching up to do. Just want to say one thing on that, though. Yeah. Um, I was really um, interested to read in the paper today about Twiggy Forest's move to um, power all of his projects by 2035 uh, with renewables. Um, and, to, and he made the point that he's not just going net zero, he's going real zero which I think is a really interesting pivot. Uh, he's saying it's going to it's going to be saving him uh, and his business um, uh, 800 million, 900 million dollars a year mm. by going totally green power uh, and uh, and transitioning. So um, if big uh, resource intensive um, industries like his can do it, um, well, you know, what's the problem? Yeah. And just on the, the difference between sort of net and absolute zero, the net is usually made up of these carbon credits. Now, currently, there's an investigation going on because there's serious integrity issues with Australian carbon credits. 70 to 80 percent lack integrity or a low integrity. And the problem here is that we've seen a rush by companies who have taken on net zero and then said, oh, wow, how do we actually meet that? And bought up these carbon credits that they're not actually decarbonizing. And some of these carbon credits might not necessarily represent real emissions reductions. And so that's why you actually need to have the government set a clear hierarchy of mitigation, that you need to do everything you can to reduce your emissions first, kind of before like before you, before you do it. Credits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's really only supposed to be used for the mm -hmm. sectors that just have no alternatives right now. Like if you're going to fly, you know, there aren't the electric planes or the biofuels, yeah. then yeah, sure. Or if you're a cement industry and there are no alternatives, sure. But if you're a fossil fuel company and you're expanding your production and you're justifying it by buying carbon credits, that's not the purpose. And on top of that, if the carbon credits are hollow, if they're hot air, then actually you've just increased the emissions. We're just increasing the emissions exactly. and making the problem worse. All right. Well, we might go now to questions from the audience. Just a reminder that you can upvote other people's questions and leave comments on them um, as well. Um, <clears throat> the first question I'm going to tackle is from Ian Jackson. Sarah, he asks, 
will your bill, if passed, have force in relation to state projects that aren't subject to federal law? Well, this is part of um, the overall changes that <clears throat> have been called for. Uh, uh, I don't know if, Ian, you might remember, um, and others might, uh, there was a what we called the um, Graham Samuel review. Graham Samuel did a um, review of Australia's environment laws and showed that they were incredibly weak in, in many areas. And um, what uh, the recommendations out of that review was that so much more of this is streamlined so that we're not seeing things fall between the cracks. So this climate trigger bill would be uh, a change to the environment uh, laws in so much that what is being assessed federally would need to be caught by this. Um, but there is going to be another stage, which is bringing um, Australia's laws uh, much more universal and uh, so that we won't be seeing things fall, fall down the cracks. Um, the next question is from Michelle Smith. She asks, do we need a global levy on fossil fuels with the revenue to be used to address loss and damage around the world? Richie, I might throw that one to you first. Uh, yes, is the answer. <laughs> we should. Uh, you know, call it a carbon price, call it whatever you want. But right now, you know, in most countries, including here, it's free to pollute. And we need to put a price on pollution. One way or another, there needs to, that needs to be felt because right now we're all paying for the consequences indirectly. Every time there's a climate disaster, those people on the front lines are paying, the Australian taxpayer is paying with all the disaster relief and support and the rebuild that comes afterwards. Who's not paying is the fossil fuel producers. And so, yes, one way or another, they should be feeling that price. And that should be channeled towards paying for those impacts because the bills are going to keep growing. And when we had, you know, um, President Rumengesau here, he said one natural disaster in Palau can wipe out their entire GDP. Wow. And so how are you going to deal with that? This will be a big conversation at, at the COP in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, there will probably won't be a solution because it's an intractable one. But at the end of the day, the bills are mounting and there's clearly companies and major producers that are responsible. And how do we link those two together? Well, we could start by putting a, a levy on them domestically in Australia and a, a levy on uh, coal and gas companies to help pay for uh, the climate damage that's done uh, domestically would be a good start. Mm. Yeah, and the Australian Institute has a proposal on a climate disaster levy for just a dollar a tonne and only on exported um, fossil fuels as well. So there won't be any impact on Australian energy prices. So that's a good way to start that. And the billions of dollars that uh, this uh, 12 months worth of um, flood damage has caused, and it's only going to get worse over summer. Mm. Yeah, uh, scary to kind of contemplate another wet La Nina summer, given, as you said, the damage that um, so many communities have already experienced and are probably still dealing with. The next question is from uh, Tyrone uh, Delisle. Uh, he asks, the green transition requires a massive expansion of mining to provide the resources to produce solar panels, EVs, wind turbines, etc. How will your bill ensure, or this climate trigger bill, won't slow down new projects that support this transition? That's a really good question because um, you're right. Uh, we, you know, in terms of the transition is going to require um, uh, uh, new amounts of resources to do the good stuff that we need to do. Um, but we're very clear about you can't just keep making the situation worse. So um, like what, you know, Twiggy Forrest has uh, nominated today, that his uh, industry is going to go to um, totally being green powered uh, through renewables, um, we would be wanting to make sure we send a signal to uh, the market under this bill that says, um, any new project uh, needs to be making itself as clean as possible. And so that means uh, ensuring when we talk about Australia being a superpower, a renewable superpower, we're talking about uh, our, th those areas of manufacturing and resource development that is being able to be powered with renewables, with storage, uh, obviously makes it uh, over, overall cheaper uh, for those manufacturers. Um, and it's better for the environment. I, I just, it's really interesting to see that they've done, they've crunched the numbers on Fortescue Metals and have shown that it's going to save them nearly $900 million a year by going green. 
Yeah, it's not small change, is no, it, Richie? No, no, that's right. It, it's huge. And the Australian government can be basically fast-tracking that. Like one idea which we're putting forward in our safeguards mission is, could you have just a, a penalty price, in like, like a carbon price, right, this, that instead of buying a carbon credit for cutting down trees that were never going to be cut down anyway, you pay the government a set fee, and that then goes into a pool of money that we actually use to build the solutions that we want here. Because we have industrial policy, right? We're just directing it towards these carbon credits. We did it before with the renewable energy target. Now we need to do it in terms of building these solutions and facilitating that transition. Mm. Uh, the next question I've got is from Ivan Quayle. He says... Um, well, he talks about the clean energy regulator and how they calculate um, emissions. And I think, uh, well, it's going into a bit of technical detail here. But right now he's talking about methane causing about a third of global warming. Um, and he's asking about questions around integrity and honesty and truth in climate accounting. Mm -hmm. um, Richie, if I can come to you first on this one, I know that Australia Institute, you've kind of briefly talked about the integrity problems with carbon offsets and things like that, but in emissions and accounting, we've traditionally not been great on that front either. No, no, there's been a bit of dodgy accounting. You know, a few years ago, it was around trying to use these leftover Kyoto carbon credits to avoid having to reduce any emissions going forward. We dealt with that. But there are still issues in terms of underreporting of our emissions, particularly around methane, mm. around coal and gas sites as well. And this is a, a problem locally, and it's also a problem globally. Now, we've seen growing amounts of interest from the government to try and address this a bit better. We're hopefully we're going to see that in terms of how they account for it. The technology is much better as well to have aerial accounting of, of methane and figure out where things are leaking and where things are getting worse, because obviously methane has a much bigger impact than CO2 in the short term. And so we would love to see more of that done. And, and Sarah mentioned when we were in Glasgow last year, the UK were, were quite good in putting on a number of um, platforms for countries to sign up to do more and one of them was a methane pledge to reduce Australia you know mm. reduce methane and Australia has to sign up to the methane pledge we've just got to get it done um, uh, it, the US are kind of uh, uh, are pushing us to do it uh, it's something we should be able to deliver um, but then the question is going to come okay if you signed up to the methane pledge um, what are you going to do to reduce methane um, and to monitor it properly I, I, I think it's crazy that um, a gas uh, a gas company can uh, simply nominate their own uh, figures in terms of what their methane leakage is. Mm. Um, there needs to be much more accountability, uh, transparency, and I don't think self accounting um, uh, is, really work. it doesn't really work. And it and it's and it's being proven not to work. Um, and we've got to get serious. And it's it's actually quite a, it's very scary um, that methane in the short term is much more. Uh, toxic and potent to the climate crisis. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of been uh, left out of the conversation for too long, and now we have a lot of catching up to do. Yeah, and you mentioned before uh, that when you know we open up new gas and coal projects, because we have a cap on our emissions, right? This forty three percent cap. That means that other sectors have to do more, <clears throat> and that includes in agriculture. And so when we talk about methane, there's really two major sources. There's sort of fossil fuel mining, mining, and then there's agriculture. And so really the opportunities are, you know, they're looking at, you know, seaweeds and other blends that you can do, but ultimately the opportunities are in actually capping and lowering methane emissions in fossil fuel projects. And that's what we need to be taken seriously. And it's no surprise that the gas industry would prefer we just talked about cows yeah. rather than uh, forcing them to do the right thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, potentially some new allies in the nationals there perhaps <laughs> to protect agriculture. Um I did have a couple of questions here that do refer to the difference between Australia's domestic emissions and domestic emissions from fossil fuel exports. Um, Richie, in terms of uh, exports and what we've been talking about with the fossil fuel sector in particular, a lot of emissions, correct me if I'm wrong, are actually just exporting the process of exporting yeah. gas overseas. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's really energy intensive to take the gas, bring it over, process it, liquefy it, and then ship it out. So if you want to know who the largest gas user is in the manufacturing mm -hmm. sector, it's the gas industry. They use more gas to process and liquefy the LNG than all the other gas users in the manufacturing sector put together. And then they charge everyday Australians a ridiculous price just to have gas at home. Yeah, that's right. Because we... 
Yeah, that's that's a whole other problem. Basically, we export the majority of our gas. Nothing was kept in reserve on the East Coast. And so Australians have to compete on the international market for our gas. So even though everyone's complaining about, you know, the situation in Russia and Ukraine, the invasion there and what that's meant for gas prices, we don't import gas. We export, you know, three quarters. Um, and so really, we've, we've created this problem for ourselves where gas prices are really high, but also gas users um, have to compete with the gas industry with the largest user in the manufacturing sector and there's huge amounts of emissions that come out of that as well so yeah um the next question i've got is from uh paul stevenson who's we've talked a lot about gas today really asking about coal supply from australia and uh, what he calls the drug dealer's defense that we always plow out that if australia reduces its uh, coal exports that other jurisdictions will just increase their production. Um, uh, can we talk about a border adjustment mechanism that other countries are kind of looking at? And uh, Sarah, are there any other policies um, that we can implement to kind of tackle this mm. thing that keeps coming up? <clears throat> well, it is a bit of a drug dealer's defence, isn't it? And it's a, we've got to, if, if we don't sell our coal, then somebody else is going to uh, get the money for it. Um, it doesn't work for drug dealers facing a judge. I don't see why it should work for uh, the coal industry in their argument to government. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is where we are. I, we need to um, we need to be um, uh, taxing these industries uh, and exports much more. Uh, we need um, a a disaster um, uh, levy uh, on them as well. Um, and we need to be stopping um, any new expansion of their facilities and getting rid of the fossil fuel subsidies. And a, a big chunk of how these um, coal companies can continue is because they're actually continuing to be propped up by public money. Um, so if there are certain things that we can do to make it uh, harder and to, to, you know, to, to fast track the transition. Um, but I think overall we have to be realistic that um, in the international conversation, um, climate change is a global problem and Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels. We can't get away from that. We are, the, we, we are one of the world's biggest exporters of pollution and therefore biggest exporters of uh, the climate crisis. And that is what we, have to, we are grappling with. Um, internationally, uh, the pressure on Australia to, to move away from coal um, is significant and it's only going to get it's only going to get louder and stronger. Richie, anything? Oh, I, I think Sarah put it really well, but I, I do like the drug dealers' <clears throat> defense because it always makes me think like Australia is a big drug dealer in this analogy, and then down the road, uh, the users of our drugs. It's like Australia complaining about oh those those drug users down the road wrecking the neighborhood while at the same time supplying them right. Like you, they point people point to other major polluters and, and say, well, if they're not doing more, then why should Australia? But the majority of Australia's coal gas, they go to China, South Korea and Japan, right? We are in a key position to help those economies transition, right? And that's what we, we should be doing. Becoming a renewable energy superpower is about helping countries transition, not keeping them stuck in the same problem that we're all feeling the impacts of. And actually, that would be good for Australian businesses mm -hmm. uh, if we were the ones uh, leading in our region to help that transition, because we do have the technology, we do have the ability, we've got the, the resources to kind of pump this out, and, and we should. You, the question, though, was also about um, border adjustment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And now that Australia, you know, we've got a new government, there's... Um, uh, you know, we're re restarting conversations around trade negotiations with the EU, um, uh, uh, other countries. Um, this topic of, uh, you know, coal, gas, fossil fuel exports is going to continue to be um, a constant in these negotiations. And we can't get away from that. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we did a paper last year basically on the European carbon border adjustment mechanism. We found there's about $20 billion in Australia's trade exposed emissions intensive goods. Now, we don't export a lot of things to Europe, but other countries like Japan are looking at this as well. 
Uh, and so that's the real risk. If we don't transition, we used to worry 15 years ago about our industries moving to other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Now it's our industry is suffering because whilst the Australian government might not be moving, the big multinationals have to take this into account. Mm -hmm. Rio has smelters uh, in areas that are running off renewable energy in other countries, and it has smelters here running off, you know, coal or gas then which one is it going to look to amp up and which one will it look to ramp down yeah um and i did want to follow up on that because i know we've also done some research around kind of the industry opportunities that sarah was referring to there you know we've got big deposits of lithium and we don't really refine it we don't turn it into batteries no value we, add. we don't no value make add. it into yeah. electric vehicles like there's a big opportunity there right yes there is and um, it, I think there is a real sense of um, optimism and opportunity feeling right now in Australia. I think uh, the election was a pivotal moment. Uh, the parliament looks different. It needs to now act differently and it needs to now follow through uh, in good uh, faith to the Australian community. And that means, uh, you know, looking at those industries who have been kind of... Um, going it alone uh, with very strong headwinds because of uh, the, the the previous uh, government settings and now say okay well where where is the investment um I, I, I why don't we have an electric car industry in Australia mm. we should um and uh, I think the time is right to get that done of course again as a um uh, senator for the great state of South Australia I'd like the electric car factory in uh, Adelaide. <laughs> yeah, that's good with me. Uh, I mean, we were part of this uh, electric vehicle summit um, that we put on with the Electric Vehicle Council and Smart Energy Council and Balanced Mike Kenna Brooks's foundation. And the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union came and the the um, the head of the union, Stephen Murphy, came, announced that he wants to work with government, work with industry to build these solutions here. So it's not just industry that want this here, the workers mm. want this here as well. So this is the opportunity we have. Yeah, and we have the skilled workers, as I think people have pointed out. You know, it wasn't that long ago we were manufacturing we can, cars. We from, can build cars. Yeah. There's still a huge parts industry, including in South Australia. So a lot of that is already there. We just need to take it that next level up. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Claire Beddington, and uh, she is uh, asking about the idea of the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, to put a price on the environment and set Australia up as, quote, a green Wall Street. Uh, Sarah, mm. how, what's the, what is the Greens thinking about that prospect? Look, there's a couple of um, elements to this. Um, this is this... Uh, um, current process of um, whether there should be credits given um, for uh, um, to, to those landholders um, who either can restore their environment or to stop them from destroying it um, further. I, we, we are at a point of um, such environmental crisis um, loss of habitat, loss of species, this all being uh, uh, supercharged uh, by the climate crisis, that we do need to do something. Um, what I'm worried about is that we end up just with a kind of another dodgy offset scheme, which um, it, it, without integrity, we need to make sure there is integrity in this process. But what we really need is a, rather than a, what I, I'm trying to explain it for people so that you can understand the difference. There's the offset. I can do this over here if I offset it with this. But actually what we need almost is the opposite, which is mm. like an inset scheme. How, what, what is the incentives to restore the environment? Because we have lost so much already. We need to be finding ways to give investment um, and uh, an incentive for people, not just to protect, but to uh, restore. And I think that's where the opportunities uh, really lie. Um, but it's got to be done properly. And we're going to go through... Um, uh, what Tanya Plibersek is putting on the table with the fine tooth comb. Um, but I must say, if it's anything like the schemes uh, in New South Wales, um, where uh, it, the integrity issues are just um, mind boggling, the uh, Auditor General in New South Wales has found um, that there was promised land that was uh, put aside as offsets for, for example, koala habitat that just was never never eventuated. And in fact, in some in some examples, had been offset several times over. So it was kind of double counting. 
Um, so th that, that whole kind of scheme needs to be cleaned up. Um, but I'm more interested in how we not just protect what we have, but how we start restoring. Mm. Anything to add to that, Richie? We have a, a huge problem with biodiversity and somehow a new market will fix it. I mean, like, have we not learned <laughs> that lesson before? <laughs> Why don't we, if, if we want to save koala habitats, why are we off allowing someone else to destroy ones, you know, and then save that one here? Just regulate it. If we want to save these mm. biodiversity sites, then just regulate it. Like we, and we, we know do, when they are. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we, 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 like somehow green Wall Street is a good idea, but green tape is a bad idea. Like what's, <laughs> why? Why don't we just do the things we want and rather than trying to insert a market in the middle and think that these profiteers are somehow going to do a better job than the government in protecting things that we love. The government's there as a service. It has public servants working for them. They're there for the public to use. Let's direct them for the things we want. But a big part of the problem, and this is why you know we've come up with the climate trigger bill, is that the current regulations, the current laws to protect Australia's environment are too weak. They're not protecting the environment. It's called the uh, uh, Conservation Biodiversity Act. Mm. Um, and yet, um, and, and the process uh, is, <laughs> is all actually about protecting uh, the projects that are being proposed, yeah. not about protecting the environment. Um, you know, this the, the state of the environment report, I brought a prop, mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is just full of example after example as to how our environment laws are failing. So that it, it does need an overhaul, but, you know, it, it can't just be about creating um, uh, money that grows on trees. <laughs> Great way to put it. Um, Sarah, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, this whole thing was to talk about your climate trigger bill. Just for the audience one last time, can you remind them what it is the bill will do and perhaps where they can find out more information yeah. about it? So what the bill does is it uh, strengthens our environment laws. It puts in a, um, uh, a requirement that any uh, project needs to be assessed on the basis of the climate damage uh, that it may create. Um, for big polluting projects, over 100,000 tonnes of pollution, it would be, um, it, you, you wouldn't be able to get environment approval for that. For those that fall below, uh, it would need to be seriously assessed as uh, as to whether it is worth it. And you would be able to, the minister is required to think about the cumulative um, impact and effect of that. It's crazy that our current environment laws right now that are used to sign off on uh, or give the, the green light to a new coal or gas project doesn't even have to consider the climate impact of that project. So when the minister says, uh, you know, a, a new gas field or a coal mine expansion has been uh, given a rigorous environmental assessment. Um, it's not that rigorous uh, because it doesn't include climate damage at this point. Mm. So we're going to fix that. Um, there's more advice uh, and information about it uh, on my website, um, but also uh, the bill itself is going to be going off to a Senate inquiry. So you'll be hearing much more about it over the coming months. And uh, you can head on over to aph.gov.au to find the text of the bill, the explanatory memorandum, all the stuff that normally accompanies legislation. If you're a nerd like us here at the <laughs> Australia Institute, um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Senator Sarah Hanson Young, for joining us today. Thanks and thank you, me. Richie, as well. Thanks, Richie. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everyone at home, for tuning in. We really appreciate your interest. Don't forget to subscribe and find our Follow the Money podcast. You can find that wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Uh, we've got a couple of recent climate episodes that uh, should interest you. And we'll be putting up the audio from this as a podcast uh, at some point as well. Thanks so much for your time today. Take care out there and we'll see you soon. Don't forget the Australia Institute's Revenue Summit. That's going to be on the 6th of October in Parliament House. If you can make it to Canberra, it's uh, just a few weeks ahead of the budget. It's not far away now. Ticket sales end on Monday. Day, uh, and it's going to be a great opportunity to talk about all the services and public spending that Australia needs, whether that's the NDIS, the aged care sector, all of those kinds of things, and how are we going to find the revenue uh, or collect the revenue that uh, to deliver the services that the public expects. You can find details for that at australiainstitute.org.au and, uh, and we'll hope to see you there. Thanks very much, everyone.